Hello everyone, uh, we've got a video here for Philosophy 115 Critical Thinking and this is our last installment for the Chapter 8, 9, 10 uh, material on inductive reasoning. And we've got two arguments lined up for this session. Um, one is argument from analogy, the other one is inference the best explanation. And these two uh, are pretty um, different from each other. I mean there's going to be some themes that might look a little familiar, but uh, they're different in the sense that Argument from analogy is probably going to look very familiar, and inference of the best explanation might not look familiar at all. It might be a little bit uh, new or counterintuitive or just like a, a new model for how to think about um, our reasoning, our everyday reasoning. Inference of the best explanation is not uncommon. It's extremely common, but we just don't think about it in the kind of framing that you're going to get today. So I'm actually, I thought um, I would start with argument from analogy first and then go to inference the best explanation since it's the trickier one. So let's start with something that's a, a little bit more familiar. But I'm going to get right into it here um, so that we can uh, get through all this material today. All right. So um, I've got some lecture notes here. Um, and let's start here just a description of what argument from analogy is. But we're going to quickly head over here to the whiteboard. Um, where I'm going to, again, um, draw you some diagrams to help understand how these arguments actually work. Okay, now with argument from analogy, I'm actually going to give you two formalized rubrics for how it can happen. Um, but they are ultimately going to amount to the same thing, uh, just kind of patch packaging up in a different way, like six to the half dozen kind of situation. Um, and, it, and there is going to be some fun things that we're going to be able to talk about with regard to induction and deduction, like a comparison of the two, using argument from analogy as an illustration. So I'm excited to talk about that too. Okay, but here's the definition from the book. Arguments from analogy are arguments that claim that something shares a property with something else or a set of things on the basis of establishing their similarity in other respects. So... I'm able to take something I know about one thing and apply it to another thing because they're similar in other, other respects. So here's the version the book has. Object A has properties P, Q, R, and so on. Objects B, C, D, and so on, it could just be one thing or it could be many things, also have properties P, Q, R, and so on. Objects B, C, D, and so on have property X. Property X is going to be like the disputed property. Therefore, object A probably, because this is inductive reasoning, it's fallible. Object A also has property X. Let's draw this. So we have, on the one hand here, uh, one category. And then over here we have another category. And then we're going to have this. And this, and this. Sorry, I should have drawn this diagram before we got started. I've had some students in the past uh, tell me that this looks like a face, uh, which I think is funny. We're going to do this, and we're going to do a little, o, little therefore symbol. Actually, I'm probably going to do this too. Okay. And then, so, okay, so we got, we have object A over here. And I'm going to use some other language here that I think is somewhat helpful. A is going to be the disputed case. Um, so let's do, oh, dang it. Let me make this smaller. There we go. Object A is the disputed case. And it has properties P, Q, R, and so on. Maybe some more. Again, 3 is not the absolute minimum here. There could be less. There could be more. It could just be one thing. Um, but this is referencing how it could be a group of things that are similar here. And then you have objects B, C, D, 
and so on, which we'll call the analogous cases. There we go. They also have P, Q, R, and so on. I'm going to talk about these as the cited similarities. Okay, so the things that are supposed to be the same between the disputed case and the analogous case, those are the cited similarities. And then down here, we have property X. And this is um, what's the word I uh, I just had it. What was it? Um, yeah, we'll we'll just call this the disputed property. I thought like I had some other word for this. Oh oh oh, that's right. That's the phrase I like to use. The property in question, which kind of means the same thing. The disputed property. But X is the property in question. So my diagram here is fitting with the usual um, semantic and syntactic conventions I've been using for these diagrams for inductive arguments in that the circles represent things and these little lines that come off of it are representing properties that this thing has. Okay, So going back to our lecture here, we've got Object A has properties P, Q, R, and so on. Okay, so that's captured in the picture here. Object A has these properties. All right? Objects B, C, D, and so on have those properties as well. Okay, we got that over here. These objects, this set of things, again, it could just be one, have whatever property or properties are here. And those are, those are things we know as premises. That's why I'm calling them cited similarities. When someone's making this argument as a premise, they're saying, hey, these objects have these properties. And then they make one more premise. Objects B, C, D, and so on have property X. This is, again, something that's known. These are The analogous cases are known cases. I know that they have these properties. I know that it has these properties. The inference comes in here, the therefore. Because of these three premises, therefore, the disputed case also has this property. I call it the disputed case because it's the case in the conclusion. Right? That's the thing that's controversial that you're making an argument to prove something about. So this is the disputed case with the property in question. So object A also has that property. Um, so this picture is saying, because these things are the same in some ways, there should be also the same in this other way. So let, let's here's, a, here's an example of an argument from analogy. It's a really bad one, but I'll give it to you anyway. I mean, you can have bad versions of all these arguments. Um, let's say uh, I'm like, your car, that's A, is red, has property P. I'm like, well, that's like my car, the BCD things, which is also red, and my car goes fast. So I think your car is going to go fast, too. That's a really bad argument from analogy. But it counts as an argument from analogy here. Um, because the cars are both red, and I know mine goes fast, I'm going to think yours goes fast, too. Okay? That's, that's how argument from analogy works. And we're using this constantly. Like I said, I think this is pretty familiar. You're constantly relating cases that you're currently making judgments about or making predictions about based on things that you've already experienced that were similar. So like when you meet a new person and you're like, you remind me of my friend blankety blank. And then you're bringing all those expectations based on your knowledge of that person and what their personality was like or what their interests were or what their beliefs and values are as a way to make predictions about something else that's true of them that you can't directly observe. Um, so that, that kind of thing is, uh, it would be an example of argument from analogy. It could also be like at work where you're like given a job and you're like, well, this is kind of different from what I've done before, but it's pretty similar. I like, I know how to do this. I'll know how to do this project because I've had experience with something similar. Um, 
if uh, I'm gearing up, um, I, I do like sports. I went for a long time with not liking sports, but I still like sports. And just when I was ready to uh, swear off football, then my Chicago Bears were just so good, and uh, they are fun to watch. Um, so I'm gearing up for, foot, for football, and football is a pretty good example here. Let's say a quarterback. Uh, I know maybe not all of you football is going to work for, but it's a sport. Uh, but quarterback is an offensive player uh, the, on the side of the team that's trying to score points if you don't know anything about football at all. And uh, there's the other team will play defense when the, when the other team is playing offense. So a quarterback, an offensive player, if they see a defense lining up in a certain pattern, they're like, oh, I know this defense. I've seen this before. I know how to handle this. This this new situation is going to be like those old situations. They're going to do this. And so I think the, the one that I'm facing, I know that those other defenses I've had experience with in the past that looked like that did this thing. So I think this one, which also looks like those, is going to do this thing. Basically, relating past experiences to current experiences is argument from analogy. I mean, it's it's super common. We're using it all the time. I... I wish I could talk to you and see your faces right now and be like, right? And you could be like, uh-huh. But I'm pretty confident that that's your, gonna be your reaction when, I'm, when you're watching this video. Um, there's no one in chat today again, so I don't have anyone to pick on. Um, but I think if you're watching this on YouTube later, you'll be like, yep, yep, pretty familiar with that. And this is uh, not just a common form of reasoning, but one that uh, we think about more or less along these lines even like I don't think presenting this diagram to you is like rocket science like you know, you're not already tracking what's happening here um, and when we get to the standards there might be some technical things about how to evaluate arguments from analogy that might feel a little new but I think for the most part it's gonna feel pretty familiar and in fact you might have even used some of the language uh, that we're going to be using to talk about arguments from analogy in the way that you've thought about or talked to other people about your analogous reasoning whenever you make arguments of that kind, when you're reasoning in that way. That's the pattern. Okay, so this is very clearly an inductive argument based on the way the book is forming it because it's easy to imagine how all of these things could be true and yet the conclusion is false. All right, so this is not a valid argument, so it's not deductive. It's not deductively valid. However, there's another way in which, at least among philosophers or people who are trying to be a little bit more technical with their arguments, might present an argument from analogy. Um, this happens a lot in moral arguments because uh, we, in moral philosophy, when we're talking about particular actions and whether they're right or wrong, we're oftentimes relating how we should evaluate um, a disputed case, like what's the right moral evaluation, based on how it's similar to other cases that we're not so confused about. It's like, well, you think this about this case, right? This one's the same thing, right? You should apply the judgment you have in this case that's not controversial over into this case that maybe is controversial. It's a way to try to avoid having double standards or being a hypocrite. Um, that we're treating like cases alike in in our ethical evaluation of them, yeah, not having double standards. So this shows up a lot, but usually arguments from analogy are packaged in this different way. So notice notice how this one works. Objects B, C, D, and so on have property X. So that's the same as what we have here, right? This little line here. Objects B, C, D, and so on have property X. Object A the disputed case, is similar to B, C, D, and so on in all of the X relevant ways. In other words, the claim here is that, oops, that's not what I want to do, with respect to any other factors or variables that could influence whether something has property X or not, they are exactly the same. Right. So therefore, Object A also has property X. Now this is deductive. This is valid. This argument is valid. There's no way for these premises to be true, and yet this conclusion is false. If objects B, C, D, and so on have property X, and A is actually identical to them 
in any way that is relevant for whether something would have property X or not, then it must also have property X. There's no way it can't. If A didn't have property X, when B, C, D, and so on do have property X, then there's got to be some difference that matters for whether or not something is has X or not, right? There, there's going to be something else that's different. Um, the moral example is really, really good here. So, because uh, things can be different in other respects that have nothing to do with X, right? If X is a moral property, then the situations might be different, but not in a way that is morally relevant, that wouldn't affect our moral evaluation of the case. So say some scenario uh, has the property of being morally permissible. If some other scenario is similar to that first scenario in all the ways that are morally relevant, in all the ways that could affect our moral evaluation, then we're forced to say that scenario A is also morally permissible on pain of contradiction. So this is, this is deductively valid. Um, but here's the rub. So here's the thing I was excited to talk about. Remember, arguments have two standards for whether they are good. They need to have a good support relation, and a valid argument definitely has that. But they also need to have all true premises. Let's go back to the inductive version of the argument. Up here, it's really easy to prove the premises are true. It's just probably going to take direct observations, something like that. To do, these are supposed to be known properties. Right? It's not going to be hard to prove them. What's hard is whether that justifies believing the conclusion. Right? And it's seen explicitly with the probably here. Just because they share these properties doesn't logically necessitate that they have to share this property. Okay, just because they share P, Q, and R doesn't mean they have to share X logically. So the support relation is the weakness of this argument. Defending that the premises are true, probably not going to be that hard. If we know anything is true, we're usually going to know these sorts of things. Like, like if I'm saying, my car is red and goes fast. How do I know this? Well, I looked at it and I drive it. I don't actually have a car, so that's a lie. But if I did, I mean, it'd be pretty available knowledge to me. And I can like look and see, oh, your car's red. That's all uncontroversial. Now what's controversial is me drawing from that basis the conclusion your car goes fast. Um, just because it's red like my car that goes fast. That's the tough part. Now over here, the support relation is not the problem. Support relation's perfect. It's valid. There's nothing more we could ask out of it. But what it trades for on the standard of having a good support relation, it gives up. Whatever it gains there, it gives up. There's a trade-off here with the premises being true. And here's why. It's not premise one. Premise one probably be just observation, right? But how about this one? For me to know that object A is similar to B, C, D, and so on in all of the X relevant ways requires me to know what are all the X relevant ways. And a complete analysis of a phenomenon like that is very hard to do like especially in ethics like for me to know what all of the morally relevant variables or features of a situation are I can't claim that and I'm a professional ethicist I know that uh, over the course of human history and philosophical discussion that there were sort of moral variables that we weren't tracking before and then like once someone was like hey what about this and we're like oh shit that is morally relevant. So I might still have some moral blind spots right now. We all have moral blind spots, I think. There's maybe some elements of even, I would dare I'd say, objective universal moral truth. You might not be confident about that. I, I think that exists. And there might be some things that we're like, I'm pretty sure about some things, while uh, you're tracking some morally relevant variables that are totally legitimate and objectively true. But there might be other ones that you're missing. And to say that you have an exhaustive analysis of all of that, that's a big deal. And it's not just for morality either that this complication shows up. Um, say that they were the same in all of the physically relevant ways, like if we're doing, making some claim about scientific properties. Science has never claimed to have that kind of exhaustive knowledge. We don't know all the physical forces that exist. I mean, we, we try to capture all the ones that we're in a position to be able to observe and reason about, but that there's other things going on that we haven't observed or that we might be ignorant to, yeah, that could happen. That's always something that's lurking 
uh, outside of the realm of what we can empirically observe and reason about and run experiments on. Um, in fact, this is, uh, I, I think I brought up string theory a couple times or quantum physics. I always feel a little guilty about doing that too much, but I mean, this is part of string theory as a contemporary theory of uh, physics is that it, it makes predictions about things that we're not capable of observing like in folded dimensions inside of the four dimensions, the three normal spatial ones, and then, the, and then time, that there, string theory predicts that there are other dimensions that are not things that we have any kind of perceptual access to, um, and maybe in principle could not. Um, so there's certain things that we, we might not be able to test or may, might not be able to observe or understand. Um, we can learn some things about black holes, but there's a lot of things we don't know about black holes because you're not able to observe them. You don't know what goes on beyond the event horizon. We can't run experiments under those conditions, right? So there's there's a lot of things we don't we don't know um, about any given phenomenon that we're trying to make judgments about. Okay, uh, that we're going to say something has a certain type of property. We don't know all of the things that affect whether or not that property is present or absent. Um, so here, the first, again, the, just to summarize this, first argument is tough because the support relation is very fallible. The second version is tough because I'm not sure, it's, it's very hard to prove that premise two is true. There's a high, high burden of proof on that claim. It's very doubtable. Um, so while it looks like they're really different arguments, they're actually the same. I mean, the difficulties that make me wonder whether this follows from these premises is also the exact same concerns that make me wonder about whether two is true. So it's it's sort of interesting how um, you can take basically the same abstract argumentative intention or spirit and and package it up in deductive versus inductive scenarios, which is another reason to think that you know, validity is not the end-all and be-all of a, a good support relation. It might just be doing one of these kinds of trade-off things. Okay, that's not a super big point, but I wanted to warn you about this, or at least give you some exposure to it, because you will see this version of argument from analogy two, and the fact that it looks valid doesn't mean it's any stronger than this version. Okay. So that's what arguments from analogy are. Now let's talk about how to evaluate them. Again, the book talks about the premises being true. Don't worry about that. We're just going to skip that. These are the three things I really want you to worry about. Uh, this fifth one is kind of a bonus. Um, the more controversial the, the conclusion, like how disputable, oops, that's not that again. The more disputable or controversial this phenomenon is or this kind of case is, then you're going to want a stronger argument from analogy in order to shoulder your burden of proof about that. Um, but that's something we already know about. We talked about that with guarding way, way back. Um, so this is, this is not the thing I really want you to focus on. These things are, these are the big ones. The cited similarities must be relevant to the claim of the conclusion. The similarities must also be important. And there must be an absence of relevant disanalogies. So let's break those things down one by one. It is very easy to mix these up with each other. Uh, whenever uh, exam two happens and I'm grading it, I always have a bunch of students who are, who are kind of like ping-ponging between these or using considerations for one that are really more about another one. So um, this is something I want to make sure that you have these standards very clearly delineated in your mind after this lecture is over. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of try to spell these out very, very distinctly, but if this lecture doesn't clear up all of your questions about that, if you're not feeling like you're, you really know where the lines are drawn between relevance, importance, and relevant disanalogies, then uh, we should talk about it. And, it. and it might be that you won't discover that until you do some of the homework problems here, but I think once you do those homework problems, you'll know where you stand a lot better here. Okay, uh, in order to make this uh, diagram fit, I should actually make it smaller. Oops. Let's not do that. Do this in one go. Come on. There we go. So let's go there. Go a little further. 
that should be adequate. Okay. Give us enough space here. All right, now I'm also going to use the convention I used before where anything in red is stuff you have to think about and come up with. It won't be given to you in the problem. The only information that will be given to you in the problem is what you see in black here. This will all be given. But everything else won't be. So our first standard, standard number one, is about relevance. And it says the cited similarities must be relevant to the property in question. And by relevant, we're really just wondering, is there any ground of connection between the properties up here and the property down here? So I'm going to draw this like this. And I'm actually going to draw these dotted lines. Um, I'm going to draw one for each to emphasize how in order to evaluate this standard, you really need to take the cited similarities one by one. You cannot group them together, like you can't pork barrel them, if you know what that term means from politics. Uh, you, can't, you can't throw them all into the same mix and evaluate the lot. You need to go after these things one by one. Um, did someone show up here? Yay, Neil's here. Um, cool. Awesome. Uh, oh, you were here 15 minutes ago. That's great. Um, so you maybe you did uh, you were here when I was like no one's here. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, cool. Thanks. Happy to have you here. Okay, so in evaluating relevance here, the relevance standard for an argument from analogy, you need to ask yourself the kind of following two questions. One. Is there any ground of connection between the properties up here, the cited similarities, and the property in question? Second question, if so, what is it? Okay, so you're, with relevance, we're identifying whatever is the medium that connects these two things together. If we associate them with each other, what's the ground of that association? Um, I've talked about this theme before as a theme of critical thinking and a critical reasoner that a lot of times uncritical thinking is just like loose association. We're just like, oh, these two things go together. This idea, that idea, I just associate them. That's all I'm thinking about is just I like labeled them that they go together in my brain. That's it. But uh, a critical thinker is going to think about what's the way in which they're related. So like there's a big difference between ideas being related, like say two claims being thematically related versus argumentatively related. That is, they have a support relation, right? Like that one can serve as the argument or evidence for the other, uh, or justification of why you should think it's true, as opposed to them, them being like just in the same topic, right? Or that things get culturally associated that are not logically entailing each other. Those, that's a big difference. Um, versus a causal connection or um, a habit of human psychology, like a bias, something like that. There's a lot of ways in which two things could be associated with each other, and relevance is asking you to identify what the ground of that connection is. Um, why, why would we see, or in what way can we see these cited similarities, again taken individually, as relevant to the property in question? that these are things connected with this. Probably, uh, if you're thinking about, like, some of those things feel stronger than others, right? That, like, a, a causal connection would be stronger than a cultural connection. I agree with you about that. But that's getting into the next standard, and that's standard number two, importance. So if relevance is just asking to identify or are these things relevant? If so, yeah, on what terms, on what grounds? Importance is trying to weigh that. So trying to evaluate how strong of a connection is it. And this happens by, I can kind of draw it like this thicker line that I'll, I'll, I'll give some, some girth to here like this. Because we're kind of wondering like, how strong of a connection is this? Not just is there a connection, that's what relevance is asking, but importance is about how tight of a connection. And 
there's uh, there's also a way in which evaluating importance. So let's, let's, let me just draw some arrows here. So relevance are just about these dotted lines. Importance is about this, but it's also thinking about all of the other things that might be connected to property X. So you're also getting into this stuff down here. Okay, so when you're testing for importance, you want to ask yourself the question, are these cited similarities at the top of the list, are they the central most determining factors or variables or indicators of something having property X or not having property X? Okay, so because again, what argument from analogy is doing is saying the fact that there are these similarities is the grounds for thinking there's this similarity. So are, are we looking at the right things? Are we looking at the right features? Are these the features that make the most sense for determining whether the feature, the, the case, the disputed case has the property in question? So for example, let's, let's do the moral one again. If I'm making a debate about, or I'm trying to make an argument about how a disputed case is, let's say morally wrong this time, that I'm like, you should think that this case, this behavior in this case is morally wrong. Why? Because it's just like this other morally wrong thing that's going on. Look at the things that they have that are morally relevant, the morally relevant features. It might be that I picked out things that actually are morally relevant, so they might meet the conditions of relevance, and yet they're not that important, or they're not the most important things that determine whether something is, is right or wrong, like morally right or wrong. They're like, yeah, that moves the needle a little bit, but not as much as these other factors. So you want to kind of ask yourself, based on your background assumptions, what other things do you know about, based on those background assumptions, that you think of as being pretty important for determining whether anything has this claimed feature or not, Okay, this, this uh, property in question? And then are the things that were cited in the argument at the top of that list? Right? Are they the centrally most important important determiners of whether something has this property or not? Okay, I am so thankful that you are in the chat here, Neil, because um, I can check in with you and see how my explanations are going. Uh, today, especially with what we're going to do a little bit later on, that's something I'm going to be particularly uh, self-conscious about. So how's it going so far with the distinction between relevance and importance? Sure. Yeah, so I, there was one I was presenting at the beginning of the lecture here where I said, um, you know, my car, uh, uh, let, let's do it this way. Uh, I'll start it over here. Your car is red. Hmm, that's interesting. Your car has the red property. You know, my car is also red and it goes fast. It has this property in question. So therefore, uh, your car goes fast too. Oh, I realize, Neil, you are not seeing my whiteboard. Let me set that up for you like we've done before. It might be hard to understand what I'm talking through if you don't see the diagram. Because uh, I have more useful diagrams for this lecture. Here, I'm going to pause the recording. My computer's slow, having technical difficulties. Working? It's perfect. Yes. I'm able to get my webcam going and have the whiteboard that you can see and everyone on YouTube can see. <sighs> Wrangling technology to my will. All right. So um, I was wondering about, uh, so I gave you that example of the red car. Uh, go, your car over here, disputed case. I'm going to say it goes fast. Why? Because it's red, like my car, which is red and goes fast. Okay, so is the color of the car relevant to the property in question? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, there's there's a very thin connection, and that's mostly just how insurance companies operate because they figure red cars are more likely to be sports cars or that people who drive red cars are more psychologically prone for speeding with them. 
but I mean this is not really a big relevant thing. Um, and if, you, if that was an exam problem and you said it's not relevant, I would not fault you for that. Um, I really had to grasp at some straws there to find a possible thread of connection. But what are some other things we could say? What if I said, well, I think your car goes fast because it's like my car, which is a, a, a Honda, something like that. Do you think the uh, company that made the car is relevant to whether or not it goes fast? Well, there, I mean, there, what we, how would we explain the ground of that relevance? Like, why would that matter? Why would the company that's making the car, why would that have any possible connection with the speed that the car can go? And all we really need here is identifying the ground of how this could be a relevant variable is that different companies might specialize in making cars with regard to different pursuits. So if they made one car that goes fast, then maybe they make other cars that go fast too. But the same observation that I think you're, you're reflecting on right now is also useful for talking about importance because you're sort of guarding about it, right? All you got to do for to, to uh, explaining the relevance answer is to just identify the ground on which they would be connected. Is there any thread that connects these two things together? If so, what is it? With importance, it's like, okay, how tight of a connection is that? Does that, even if it's a relevant property, is it at the top of the list for things that are going to make the biggest impact or be the biggest indicators of something having this property or not having this property? And my guess is, you're probably going to say when I ask it that bluntly, no. That the company that makes the car is not the most important, and it's not even near the top of the list for whether it's uh, the car goes fast or not. Because com car companies can make lots of different types of cars, and they might make, uh, Honda makes higher performance vehicles, and they also make like commuter cars. You know, so they're that are not interested in being able to go super fast, but it's more important we're having low gas mileage or stuff like that. So um, talking about that is going to require you, like I just did, to get into factors that are not given in the original problem. You have to think about your background assumptions about this property in question and compare that against the things that were highlighted to figure out if these things that were cited in the argument are the most important. And if you don't think that they're the most important, I highly recommend in explaining your answers to tell me which ones you think would be more important. Um, okay, so is that is that feeling pretty good, Neil? Yes, that's clear. Cool. On the subject, now that we, like I gave an illustration with a particular case and like giving answers, I want to take this time to make a little tangent interlude. I wanted to do it at some point today. I'm afraid I'm going to forget, so I'm just going to do it now that I've remembered it. Um, in preparation for exam two, which is going to be coming up here uh, over the weekend, in exam two, when you're doing the inductive argument section, you're going to be asked to evaluate inductive arguments a lot. And that's going to mean longer form answers. Think stuff that's more like when you had to explain how the conversational implication was generated on exam one. Like you had to talk me through your thought process. You're going to have to do a lot of that on exam two. The formal logic stuff, you don't have to do any explanation. You just got to make truth tables and translations. But when it comes to evaluating inductive arguments, it's a lot of explaining your reasoning. And don't skimp on the explanation really talk through all the background assumptions that you're using, just like you had to do for explaining conversational implication on exam one. But the, the big thing I wanted to emphasize, I was talking with a, a student last night on the phone and we, we talked about this and I was like, everyone needs to get this as a reminder too. Um, the way I grade exams is I don't look for reasons to take points away from you. I'm always looking for excuses to give you points. And I talked about how on the grading for the exam, I want to be able to communicate a message to you about how good your work is. Like, 
I don't, I'm not going to give full credit answers to just merely adequate answers, uh, but I want to give those for excellent answers. But I'm, I'm looking to like, you basically, you don't start with a 100% score and then I put hits to it. That's not how I grade. Your score starts at zero and I'm looking to award you credit. So especially on this second exam, especially with the inductive argument sections, you need to be giving me those excuses. In other words, your explanations need to be able to reveal or demonstrate that you understand what these standards like relevance and importance are and how they are to be applied and wielded in cases of analysis. Um, I, I, if your answer is ambiguous or weird uh, and I'm like, I don't know, maybe they know what they're talking about, then you're not going to get credit. Okay, you're, you'll get no credit. <laughs> so I wanted to warn you all about that heads up right now, so you know what the expectations are. Um, I my uh, experience from teaching this class many times before has informed me to like make this super explicit to my students and really emphasize it because early on when I started teaching um, this class, like the first couple times. I, I was like, man, students are giving me just really bad answers. And then I was like debriefing it with them. I'm like, what's going on here? Like, there's a lot more you need to explain here to give adequate answers. And the thing I consistently heard was students were afraid to say more out of risk of saying something wrong. And they didn't want to give me any excuses to take points away from them. So they're like, less is more. <laughs> and my response to this strategy is, it's not going to work with the way that I'm grading and uh, more is more and less is less. Like that's basically the situation. Um, so don't skimp on the explanation. Go, if anything, go overboard. There, there is a limit at like where you're kind of over analyzing and that might make me worried that you don't know what you're talking about either because you're just throwing anything out there and hoping something sticks. Um, but definitely you need to, you're gonna, with all of these evaluations, background assumptions show up at every stage. Think back to when we were talking about statistical generalizations and applications. You had to use background assumptions to figure out um, sample bias, bias in investigation, bias in interpretation, whether the reference class chosen is the most relevant for uh, in, in when it came to statistical applications. All those standards required you thinking about what you know about the world outside of the problem that's being given to you. Um, so uh, that's definitely going double with arguments from analogy and inference the best explanation. In fact, so much explanation is required to really give good answers to like just even with the two standards we already have. You have to treat each cited similarity one at a time, evaluating it for relevance and for importance and explaining those answers. Because that's going to take so much time, there's only going to be one problem on argument from analogy on the exam on exam two. And there's only going to be one problem for inference of the best explanation. Uh, so those are, uh, given that there, you're not being asked to deal with a lot of problems, um, make sure that the ones I am asking you about, you give really full treatment. And you're not under the gun with the time. You got 24 hours for the exam just like before. So, uh, you know, make use of it. Give me, give me your best answers that you possibly can here. Uh, is that making sense to you, Neil? Yes, yes, yeah. Argument, the, the one argument from analogy and the one inference, the best explanation, are the two single problems that are worth the most overall points. And you can check it out on the study guide. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me do a little more drawing here. So the last standard that we've got is uh, there's an absence of relevant disanalogies. And let me explain what those are. They could be like this. I'll explain all this in a second. It 
actually we can even do this. There we go. Okay, so let's go back to the, uh, the logic of analogies initially. So if I, if I offer this kind of argument from analogy, then I'm saying we should draw a certain conclusion about this case based on how it's similar to these other cases that we already know about. Well, a disanalogy is kind of like a tug of war where you've got other cases that pull in the opposite direction. So these are cases that don't have the property in question, they, it's the not sign there, um, but are also similar to the disputed case. And they might be similar with respect to the properties that we had before, the P, Q, R, and stuff, or they could also be involving new properties. And those properties don't need to be similar to these cases, they just need to be similar to the disputed case. So uh, that, that's going to look like this. And maybe I can give an example again. So let's say um, I'm like, oh, your car goes fast because it's like my car, which is a Honda, that kind of thing. But then if I'm like, well, wait a second, I also know these other cars, though, that they definitely don't go fast. And they're like your car, which is a sedan or something. I don't know, like the, the, um, the type of car. So that was not a part of the original analogy, right? The, the type of car was not a cited similarity. But as long as the disanalogy that I'm aware of from my background assumptions and knowledge of the world doesn't have the property in question and is similar to the case that's disputed, then that's a relevant disanalogy right there. Okay. Again, whatever are these cited similarities need to be relevant and important to this phenomenon of whether something has X or not. Um, so if you come up with disanalogies, but the things that make them similar to the disputed case are like not that important, well, then that's not going to pull that tug of war very far in the other direction. But if they are relevant and important in their own right, then uh, that's going to diminish the strength of the original analogy. That's the idea of disanalogies. So if we have some cases that make me think, oh, this does have property X, maybe there's some other cases I'm like, oh, but it could not have property X too because they're similar in this other way. That's going to blunt the force of the in initial inference. Okay. Um, again, it, this is all this stuff in red, stuff you've got to come up with. And you may not have a lot to go off of here, and that's the other uh, bit of advice and warning that I've got for you. Um, you might need to just talk about your suspicions or what possibly could be going on here. Uh, let's, let's actually, I'll talk about a, a, a homework problem here um, to try to help with this. Um, so one of the problems from the homework says something like, um, uh, this, this, uh, the, whoa, look at this Siamese cat. I think this Siamese cat's going to bite me. Why? Um, because my aunt had a Siamese cat that bit me. So the disputed case is this cat. The analogous case is my aunt's cat. What are the cited similarities? Well, they're both cats, and they're both the Siamese breed. And we can talk about the relevance and importance of that for biting behavior, which is what property X is, like has a tendency to bite. Um, but if I have a disanalogy here, I'm like, do I know any, maybe cats, right? That would be relevant. <laughs> we should be talking about cats. So that's a shared property here. That'd be like a PQR property. But do I know of any cats that don't bite, that don't engage in this biting behavior? They don't have a tendency to bite that are that's similar to this cat? Well, you don't know anything about this cat. All you've been told in the homework problem is that it's a Siamese cat. That's it. But you can imagine other things like, well, maybe this this cat that I, we're talking about right now is like comes from a loving home and I've met other cats that came from loving homes and they didn't bite me so maybe this cat won't bite me that would be a relevant disanalogy that'd be a great way to flesh out your answer for this third standard I forgot to put this is standard number three over here relevant disanalogies um, when you're not given very much information about the disputed case and I'll tell you right now, um, uh, I'll, I'll let out some, uh, some little spoilers for the exam problem here. I don't have any problems bringing this up because it's not going not gonna to be giving you any answers here. And for you to know about the topic ahead of time, I'm fine with that. I don't, I don't think it's going to disrupt the integrity of the exam. But uh, the problem is going to be about 
whether a certain person smokes pot or not. Um, and you don't know the person. The, the disputed case, you don't know them. I'm pulling them from people I used to know just for fun, but I'm not like, expecting you to know who this person is. Um, but you can still go through your background assumptions and your life experience to try to come up with disanalogies. Um, so you can do that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm also happy to look, kind of spill the beans a little bit here on what the topic of the exam problem is because if you don't have a lot of background assumptions about pot or marijuana use, uh, talk to me um, <laughs> and I can maybe help fill you in on some background uh, knowledge that you may not have. Um, and by that I do not mean I'm going to make you smoke weed with me. Um, students have joked about that with me in the past when I've said that. That is not what I have in mind. Uh, if you're like, and, and really the only situation in which this would be a problem is if you have like, I know nothing about marijuana, I don't even have any stereotypical knowledge about it. I'm like, if you have stereotypical knowledge about marijuana, like just from watching movies and watching television or something like that, YouTube videos, then I'm like, that's good enough. You work with the background assumptions you've got to work with. You'll still be able to demonstrate to me that you know what you're doing with this analysis because I'm not really grading you on the particular answers you give in terms of like, I thought it was doing good or bad on this standard. I'm looking at your explanation. How did you explain your determination? Let's me know whether you know whether these you understand these principles, uh, these standards in principle. Okay? I can't grade you on your background knowledge. That would not be fair. <laughs> I want to grade you on your reasoning. I can't, I can't uh, evaluate you based on how much knowledge of the world you have. What I can evaluate you on is what you're doing with it, how you're reasoning with whatever information you have, even if it's faulty information, even if it's misleading or inaccurate. Um, I can still see that you're using this technique or process properly or not. So is that, does that make sense to you, Neil, what I'm talking about right now? Okay. I, I, I've said this before, but designing exams for this class is one of the hardest things I've ever done as a teacher. Uh, like trying to pick problems that um, are going to be accessible to everybody is really tricky to do. Um, I, I've had a couple students in the past over the years that were like, I don't know anything about marijuana. They were like completely sheltered. They didn't even have stereotypes about it. And so I had to be like, okay, well, here's, here's some things about it um, for you to work with. Um, but, I mean, if you wanted to just, like, uh, Google marijuana use or something in the next couple days to, like, if you're, like, in that position, go for it. I don't care. That's why I'm happy to let you know about it ahead of time. Or if you just want to call me up and, and, and talk about, like, what are, what are background knowledge I could have about marijuana, um, I'd be happy to give you some stuff to work with. Um, so there you go. But I figured, I mean, I thought this would be a pretty low hanging fruit that like at this point, almost everybody, again, with a couple of notable exceptions, uh, has some kind of contact with this phenomenon and has some sort of thoughts about it or awareness of it. So, so that's argument from analogy. That's everything I got to say about that. Um, I think this is a good time for a break, and then when we come back, uh, Neil, we can talk about inference, the best explanation. How are you feeling with argument from analogy? Okay? Well, uh, you missed a little bit of the beginning of my lecture. Both inference the best explanation and argument from analogy are both extremely common arguments. However, argument from analogy is probably more familiar. And inference the best explanation kind of flies under the radar. We're doing it all the time, but we're not really thinking about what we're doing and how it works um, or its mechanics as much as with uh, argument from analogy, I think. But you're finding argument from analogy familiar? Cool. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. That's actually why I put it in there. I wanted to have a problem on the exam for that section that sort of talked about, or that used um, a catchphrase that you have an intuitive ability to kind of grok or kind of get in a gut way. Uh, but what is it really, what's the real message to that? And using the Gricean analysis gives you the clues to unpack it. Um, so maybe it was just frustrating, but I was hoping it would be fun too to see the theory in action like that. Mm. Well, after the lecture, if you, or at some other time you want to talk that over in preparation for the makeup, let me just plug another advertisement for, please talk to me if you want to do the makeup. I am happy to help you with uh, diagnosing, uh, doing an autopsy on the original exam and figuring out what stuff to recalibrate. Uh, let me know how I can help you with that. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no final in this class, no cumulative final. Um, the makeup exam is like your last thing that you might have contact with that material. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's take a break here and we'll come back and do IBE. All right. Inference to the best explanation. This argument is a doozy. And I'm very excited to talk about it. It's one of my favorite bits of material from the entire quarter. And I'm very much in danger of, of going, I don't know, fanboy is the right word for this, but there's just a lot of stuff that could be talked about. I could talk about this. Uh, I could talk about inference the best explanation for a solid week, <laughs> I mean, for many hours. Um, but I'm going to try to keep this lecture sleek and clear. Um, while not uh, sacrificing too much detail um, because there is a lot of stuff to explain and like I said earlier I think this argument is a little more unfamiliar to us um, not in the sense that it's not common but in the sense that we're not thinking about it explicitly we could get in the ballpark here for inference of the best explanation by me just talking about like think think back about uh, every day how like someone tells you something, or, uh, makes a claim, and you're like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I believe that. That little moment, which is oftentimes this like intuitive gut check kind of thing, is really a version of inference to the best explanation. It's just happening in your mind without you like going through a series of like premises to a conclusion kind of thing. So it's very similar to how there's all this rationality that's behind uh, conversational implication. And when we were doing the conversational implication analysis, it was like you have to kind of like figure out a way to make your brain go in slow motion so you can like see all the little connections about how you get from literal meaning to implied meaning. That's going to be pretty similar to what's happening here. Um, and in fact, Inference the best explanation is so complicated that we're not even going to be able to do it in this unit. And I will not be able to ask you, it would not be fair for me to ask you to give a full inference the best explanation analysis for a problem on the exam. Um, that's not possible. And here's the reason why. An inference the best explanation makes some, uh, draws a conclusion. Oops, I didn't want this to be read. There we go. Ugh. It draws a conclusion, and that conclusion is basically some hypothesis. It's not the making of a hypothesis, but it's a commitment that the hypothesis is true based on some observations, 
So I'm like observed facts plus this claim. The hypothesis in question explains the observations better than any other competing explanation. Now that's a really wordy thing here, but um, what basically is happening here is that I'm citing a hypothesis explanatory usefulness as the evidence for thinking that it's true. Okay, So that depends on the observations actually being true, and that's why we're putting that in here. Um, but also evaluating claim two takes so much work because you have to first judge whether what what is the worth or value uh, how good is the explanation being offered by the hypothesis but you also have to think about competing hypotheses other ways to explain it and then judge and rate those and then compare them against each other inference the best explanation is happening all the time but uh, it's very noticeable in a field that I have some experience and background with, and that's the field of cognitive science. Cognitive science is trying to understand the mind. How does thought work? How does consciousness work? How does cognition occur? And it's an infantile science, I like to always say. It's like barely has its feet under it. it. It doesn't have its feet under it. It's learning how to crawl right now. <laughs> that's how far it is as a science. It's not very developed. There's not a lot of stuff that's settled. And we don't have, uh, I mean, we have a lot of evidence to work off of. We've got a lot of observations, but we don't have the ability to really um, directly confirm or disconfirm a lot of the theories we have about how the mind could be working, like what's its functional uh, functional structure. Um, so what you mostly get in cognitive science is, well, we've got some observed cognitive abilities. We can use language. We can do arithmetic. We can um, reason about causal laws. We make predictions. We have color categories. like. There's all these things that we have demonstrated cognitive abilities with, um, and then we're trying to explain how is it possible that we're able to do the things we're able to do. Like, what enables us to do math and clams aren't doing math, right? Or um, developing language or st all this kind of stuff, right? Um, so what ends up happening is you get a lot of inferences of the best explanation. Someone's like, I have a theory. I can't directly confirm it. Right? There's no direct observational evidence or experimental evidence for this. But we know that there's some stuff that's going on, like stuff about our brains, our demonstrated cognitive abilities. Um, and people are saying, you should believe my theory because my theory can explain all that stuff better than the next theory can. And so one single argument from an uh, uh, inference the best explanation could be uh, an entire book because it just takes so much legwork to shoulder your burden of proof on making a making an argument like this and much and to evaluate arguments like this uh, it takes a similar work so I can't ask you to do that so what are we gonna do what we're gonna do is set the criteria for what makes for a good explanation so we're gonna focus here on the part about saying it's better right what would make an explanation better than another explanation that we can pin down and I can ask you on the exam to take a given explanation and evaluate it based on those criteria. I'm not going to be asking you to com compare it against other possible explanations, um, but just to sort of evaluate the explanation you're being offered uh, in accordance with these seven standards that we have. So, so that's the kind of backstory here for, for what's going on with inference the best explanation. Uh, I might use some cognitive science stuff again as examples, but I also have some other examples to work with. Um, another toy case I like to use here that I'll, I'll reference is explaining uh, like a detective is on a, at a crime scene and there's evidence, observations, and then they're trying to piece together what happened based on that. So they might form a hypothesis of who the killer is or how they did it or something, right? 
based on trying to explain the observations that are being given. Okay, so I'll use that as a toy case as well. Uh, Neil, how did my brief introductory description go? While I'm doing some drawing here, uh, maybe you can report to me about that. Okay, cool. I'm just setting up the diagram here a little bit. In explaining, um, uh, in, 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 or in talking about like which of these inductive forms is the strongest, that's that's kind of hard to do. Uh, there's some people who think uh, that the the actual common pattern for all induction is inference of the best explanation. So it's kind of a big deal that it's even plausible to be like the underlying pattern behind all inductive arguments that that maybe shows you a little bit about its importance or significance um, I'm not sure that's true but um, and I'm not teaching it that way uh, but it, it definitely has a lot of power um, but also like comparing between these forms maybe you know they're all kind of doing the same sort of thing they all can be stronger or weaker right if I had to pick one that I think of is like uh, has a lot more defeaters and is more fallible, it'd probably be uh, argument from analogy. But you're right to pick up on this note that inference of the best explanation is something we use when we can't just like directly confirm or disconfirm something. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I want to put this in here. Um, but even in, uh, like I said, uh, there's the the idea that maybe um, all induction is inference the best explanation and that would go even for direct perceptual report like there is liquid in my bottle you can see it even that's an inference the best explanation explaining that will require me to open up a big can of worms of philosophical epistemology and I'm not going to do that but <laughs> not right now at least um, but there's a I would say IBE is not something to sleep on as being like a pretty weak form of reasoning. It's actually extremely important. Um, and here's another reason. Uh, this is something I was alluding to. I, I foreshadowed this in a previous lecture uh, last Thursday. Uh, a lot of times when we think about the scientific method and scientific reasoning, we think of something more or less like SCT and NCT. The Here's a bunch of data. We analyze it for patterns and then posit hypotheses about how there are general laws and see if that fits with the evidence or not. Um, but inference the best explanation is a huge part of scientific reasoning. And a lot of scientific theories really proceed from this. And I'm not just thinking about cognitive science here, but um, string theory is a big one. Um, I might bring up string theory again here as an example for IBE. Um, evolution. Um, uh, definitely when Darwin is developing evolution, this is an IBE argument. Um, a lot of things uh, start as IBE and then receive um, more substantive uh, confirming evidence, like the Higgs boson is named for a physicist named Higgs, who was just like, this would make sense <laughs> if this existed. And then people are like, is he right about that? And then we were searching to like find it. And then uh, they found it. But it took many decades before that happened. And the basic reason for even going and looking for it was the plausibility of this inference to the best explanation. So even, um, even in its more diminished role, it still is responsible for what 
is sort of the cutting edge of a lot of science. Okay, um, let, let's get into it. There are only two moving parts to an explanation. The observations, or I'm going to call it the stuff to be explained, or a really fancy word you can use at dinner parties, uh, an explanandum. And then the hypothesis, the explanons, which gives a story about why this. Why, why did this happen? That's what explanations are always trying to do for us. Why did this happen? And we are constantly asking this question about our experience. Something happens, you're like, why did that happen? How, why, why, like a toddler, why, why, why? In fact, some philosophers, most famously Immanuel Kant, claim that that why question is so basic and so instrumental that it is actually one of the necessary conditions for being able to think at all. That if you weren't tracking why questions or weren't trying to knit together a framework or a web of explanation, that you actually couldn't experience anything at all. That in order for experience to become experienceable requires a rational framework of explanation. Um, Kant is not claiming that you have to be thinking like this reflectively all the time in order to have experiences, but that the experiences you have in real time in consciousness are the product, they are given in the form, you think about them conceptually in terms of these sorts of explanations. Even if it's something like seeing some visual abstract art at like an art museum, and you're just like, whoa, aesthetics. That you're actually, that the, that rational framework of explanation is baked in to that conscious experience as providing its form. Not necessarily its content, like that flavor of the aesthetic, but that you package up it into an object, a conceptual object. Okay, I'm going off the rails again. Um, I, I don't need to go too deep into Kantian metaphysics here, but um, this is this is a big deal. Um, different philosophers disagree about how big of a deal it is, but like I said in this class, we're focusing more on the low-hanging fruit, the stuff that's more uncontroversial, and it's uncontroversial that inference the best explanation is a pretty significant part of, of our thinking and our reasoning. There are some philosophers who really don't like it or who don't think that it is um, very useful or uh, that it is the paradigm paradigmatic example of reasoning or something like that. So there's some disputes about it, but no one no one denies that this is a significant way in which we think about things. That at the very least that's uncontroversial. Um, and the people who would reject this entirely are extremely extremely rare. Um, okay. So an explanation is as simple as here's what happened and here's why it happened. Now, all of the action here of how things get so complicated comes from how we evaluate these things. What makes for a good explanation versus a bad one? And there's seven of these standards, uh, and I'm going to knock them out one by one here. So uh, let's actually put it, um, where are we going? We're going to do false one. Yeah, let's put it right here. Okay, number one. So far so good, Neil? No, no questions popping up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just interrupt me at any time. Okay, first standard is what I'm going to call a uh, story to tell. The book says, does the hypothesis really explain uh, the observations? And I'm like, that's mm, sort of helpful. Um, but I think this idea of a story to tell is going to work a little bit better. Because the really big thing that's going on with this first standard is that if there are multiple things to be explained in the stuff to be explained, there's a question, is the hypothesis even trying to explain all of those things? Is it even offering a story that it's telling about, that's targeting each of those things? Sometimes there's only one thing to be explained. Um, like uh, you, oh man, this is a little vulgar, but um, you're like, why am I smelling a fart right now? Who did that? 
right? One thing to be explained, this sensation I'm currently experiencing, and I want an explanation. Who was it, right? Then if there's only one thing to be explained, this standard is trivially passed because they're offering a hypothesis for it. But sometimes there's more than one thing to be explained. Like go back to that crime scene example. Maybe there's a lot of evidence that's, that's peculiar that's showing up at the crime scene. And a better explanation would be able to have a story that explains all of those things and not just some of them. Or an even better example here would be, let's say you go to the doctor and you're like, doctor, I got these symptoms. And they're like, well, my diagnosis is you have this condition or illness or whatever. The diagnosis is their hypothesis about explaining why you have the symptoms that you do. And the best diagnosis would take into account all of those symptoms. It would have a, an explanation for why all those symptoms are present and not just one or two or just some of them. The more of them, the better. So story to tell is about that. I'm going to use a new color here in my diagrams uh, to really just indicate like what it is that we're referring to. So all the stuff in red is about like stuff you have to come up with out of your own imagination. Um, and I'll use green to kind of just point like what this standard is about this aspect of the scenario of what's going on here. Um, if anything about my diagram is like not making intuitive sense, Neil, please let me know. But the, the story to tell is asking about um, does the hypothesis even make an attempt to target all of the things in the stuff to be explained? That's it. Nothing more to it than that. Make sense, Neil? Cool. Number two, depth. Depth is a really interesting one. Um, there, I'm going to give you a little phrase to understand uh, what I have in mind with depth. And it's going to sound really wacky, I think, when I first say it. And hopefully uh, we can unpack it and I'll say it again and it'll start making some more sense. Um, but let me... Depth. Depth is going to be pointing here. And let me do this. All right. So what am I drawing here? All right, okay, so my phrase. <clears throat> when you're trying to test whether the explanation is deep, you're, you need to ask yourself, does the hypothesis or does the explanation stand in need of further explanation in order to see how it counts as an explanation. Let me say that again. When you're evaluating depth, uh, you're testing whether an explanation is good or bad using wh whether it's deep or not, you're asking yourself, does the explanation offered stand in need of additional explanation in order to see how it counts as an explanation? And all of those words are important here because the most common confusion I've seen with students on depth is they're trying to explain the explanation. And that is not what you need to do. So it's not like we need to give an explanation for the hypothesis. That is not what's happening here. So let's erase this right away so we don't get confused. This is not happening. That's not what you have to do. You have to see, does the hypothesis offered work as a straightforward explanation. That's a kind of another way I could put it. Let me give you an example. This one's from the homework. Uh, I think it goes something like this. Um, even though we usually have class at this time in this room, I don't see anyone in the classroom. That's the stuff to be explained. Because, hypothesis, a wicked witch made them all invisible. Now that hypothesis raises a lot of questions. Wait, what? Wicked witches? Magic powers? The power of being able to turn people invisible? Why would a witch do that? Like, there's all these other questions that start getting asked. 
but this explanation is actually a paradigmatic example of a deep explanation. It is doing perfect on depth. It has other problems, but it's not depth. Depth is not the thing that's wrong with that explanation. Because if a wicked witch made everyone invisible, it would make sense I wouldn't see them. That's what invisible means. That explanation offered doesn't need any more explanation in order to see how it counts as an explanation. The way that you can practically test depth, um, so getting away from theory a little bit, is assume the hypothesis is true and then ask yourself if you'd automatically expect the stuff to be explained to happen. So given the hypothesis being true, like just granting it for the sake of argument, okay, let's say a wicked witch made everyone invisible, what would I expect? I wouldn't be able to see them, right? Um, I'll give you an example here of a, an explanation that's not deep, but let me explain here why I've drawn the diagram the way that I have. If there's like a gap in this explanation where it stands in need of something else, like maybe the hypothesis being offered is getting you some of the story of how you could see how this would happen, but it's like it's missing something. There's a gap in here that needs to be filled in with some supplementary explanation before I can see how this really does explain this, how the hypothesis explains this stuff to be explained. So with that in mind, let's look at this example. This actually happened to me. It was like perfect timing. Uh, I was, this is from a few years back. I was teaching critical reasoning. Um, it was after Thanksgiving break, so we were just getting into the, the uh, getting into this material. And I come into class with a cane and I'm limping. And my students are like, Tim, what happened? Why do you have a limp? So they made an observation. Tim has a limp. That's something that needs an explanation. And here's the explanation I gave them. I had too much fun last night. That's not an explanation. That's not a deep explanation. It's like, okay, uh, you're painting a little bit of a picture here, a story about why you have a limp, but I don't. It, there's still something missing here, right? It's not a complete explanation. Let's use the practical test. Assume my, my hypothesis is true. I did have too much fun last night. Would you automatically expect that I would get a limp? I mean, if we talked on the phone, I haven't seen you for months or something, and you're like, yeah, so how'd things go last night? Oh, man, I had too much fun last night. And you're like, so you got a limp, huh? Like, no, no one would make that connection, right? Now, the, as the story goes, uh, I was hanging out at my in-law's house, and we were playing football in the backyard, and it was getting dark. This was Thanksgiving break. It was getting dark, but we kept playing, even though it was kind of dangerous to do that. And I jumped to catch a football, and my uh, I jumped over a rock, and there's a big hole, like a divot in the ground on the other side of the rock, and I rolled my ankle so bad. So it was like I had too much fun, right? I, we should have stopped having fun because it was getting dark, and I, and that's why I got the limp. So it was part of the explanation, like a, a deep explanation, but on its own, just saying I had too much fun last night, that's not enough, right? It doesn't get me from A to B in a straightforward way. It needs to be supplemented with some extra explanation in order to see how it counts as an explanation. All right, how's that going, Neil? Awesome. If you're watching this on YouTube later on, people who are on YouTube later, um, and you don't have the ability to ask me questions, um, I think from teaching this many, many times, when I'm in a classroom with people, I oftentimes have to say things over and over again before it kind of clicks. So we're going to be doing this. We're going to whip through all seven standards really fast. I'm going to give you the explanations. And if it's not clicking right away, I kind of recommend just like stopping the video, going back, watching me talk through it again. And it might help a little bit. If that's not doing the trick for you, though, um, absolutely reach out to me and let, let's talk more and I'll try to explain things more. Um, maybe I can get some stuff in on a, a supplementary video too for, for this unit. Uh, just like I have the discussion threads for all the other units, um, I'll be doing that with the 8, 9, 10 unit here too. So maybe you can throw those questions on there too and I can talk about it more. Um, okay, so that's depth. Next up, number three. 
oh, pardon me, power. Power's next. Oh, by the way, this is a good time to bring this up. Um, so these names, the names for the different standards, you're going to have them on the exam. Like I said before, I, uh, exam two, for all these inductive arguments, you don't have to memorize all the standards. Um, I'm going to give them to you. I'm not going to define them for you, but I'll give you the names so you're, you don't have to memorize the names. Um, but I can usually spot a mile away a student who hasn't really studied for inference the best explanation because their answers are working off of a ordinary or intuitive everyday sense of these words, the meaning of these words. And I do not encourage you to do this. The, the words that are chosen are trying to be evocative of the standard that they represent, but they don't fit perfectly here. Um, they really have technical definitions, uh, and that's what I'm trying to give you a kind of clear story about here in this lecture. Um, but you can't just go off of, uh, you can't fake this one very easily. You can't just go off of what these words intuitively might suggest to you. Uh, but make sure you have a really precise technical understanding uh, going into the exam. Okay, what's power about? Power is about whether the hypothesis can be used to explain other stuff. So there's some stuff on the table to be explained. That'll be given to you in the problem or in the, in the homework exercises uh, and on the exam. You'll get that. All the stuff in black is what you'll be given stuff to be explained, and then there's a hypothesis offered to explain it. But we're also kind of like looking out of the side of our eye here about whether there's some other stuff that this hypothesis could help with. Because we got lots of explanatory work we need doing. And if the whole idea of inference the best explanation is to say we should believe the hypothesis based on its explanatory usefulness, then if it can explain other things too, other than what we have on the table right now to get explained, so much the better. Again, everything in red, you're going to have to think about. So uh, if there's, uh, if you can come up with some things that you think this hypothesis could be helpful in explaining, then tell me what those things are. Most hypotheses have some degree of power. It's very rare to find a hypothesis that has no power at all. That it only is useful for the stuff to be explained and nothing else. We would call that an ad hoc explanation. When I make up an explanation just for this one case and has nothing to do with any other related cases of things happening elsewhere at other times, etc. That's very, very rare that that would happen. Um, I will give you one example of it, but um, for the most part, our explanations can work for many things. Another theme that this is now appropriate for me to mention about these standards for IBE is that they're not all, in different circumstances, some of these things might matter more than others. And that's really noticeable with power. <clears throat> in cognitive science, power is huge, a huge standard for discriminating between various explanations. So there might be something on the table to be explained right now, like we're having a debate about linguistic capacity. How are people able to use language? What is going on in the mind that allows that? And then someone gives a theory of how the mind functions or how it's set up structurally uh, for, that explains how we're able to use language to communicate. Like what's needed? How, do you, how does an organism go from not linguistically capable to linguistically capable, like what mechanisms need to be developed like evolutionarily for that to happen. And then someone offers a theory about that. And then uh, someone offers a different theory. Well, someone might say, hey, my explanation is better because not only can I explain language with my theory, but I can use the same theory to explain maybe how we're able to do math. Like that would be pretty cool. If it's like the same, the same basic theory of mind that it can give explanations for all these different cognitive abilities, that would be pretty good. That'd be a very elegant theory, right? They could do all this kind of work for us, all in one little package. That's super sweet. Um, and it kind of makes sense. We sort of expect this in the context of the mind because we got one brain that's doing all of these things. 
And we know at this point, we know this much, that the brain doesn't work like a clock where if you take a gear out, then the whole thing shuts down, or that there, or like a factory where one part of the factory is performing one function and another factory is performing a different function. Like our brain doesn't work like this really. The old 19th century version where it's like carving up the brain and here's where this happens and here's where this happens. Not really. There's some broad stroke things, but what we've learned is that the brain is really plastic. And if one part of the brain is damaged, the work that would normally happen there can be picked up by another part of the brain. So there's there's some way in which these things are all working together in one object. And so a theory of cognition that could show us how we can use the same brain to do all these different functions, we kind of would expect that would be uh, uh, the thing to go with. That would be a higher likelihood of being the true explanation. Um, <clears throat> rather than inventing all these different little functional parts of the brain that are responsible for the different functions. So um, power is pretty important in cognitive science. Here's a case where it doesn't matter, or it doesn't matter as much. The detective case. So uh, I've got this crime scene, right? I go to, I, I, I you know, collect the evidence. I got all this stuff to be explained. And then I, I'm thinking about, like, how am I going to explain what happened here? Now, if the sort of story I end up telling about why I'm seeing all the evidence of the crime scene the way that I am uh, is capable of also explaining all these other crimes that have been having happening around the city, like all these other murders, well, that'd be pretty cool. I mean, that's why we like watching serial killer thrillers or something, right? We're like... Like, oh, these cases are all the same, you know, where there, there's the evidence. It seems like there's the work of one person, and we're going to track that person down, right? There's a conspiracy going on. Um, we'll talk about conspiracy theories later on here. Um, but, uh, you know, that that's exciting. It's interesting. There's rational connections happening here. But because of our background assumptions about what goes on with crime, it's not like every crime is the product of a serial killer. Like every murder is the product of a serial killer. Um, a lot of crimes are just one-off crimes. And so to get the best explanation for this crime may not require being able to connect it with all these other things that are going on too, these other open cases that we're trying to solve. Um, sometimes that might happen and it might be cool, but we're not holding our breath for it and it's definitely not a, a high priority standard in that context. So again, this is demonstration of the point of how these different standards may take on more or less significance in the overall evaluation. For the exam, you don't have to make judgment calls about that. I'm not going to be looking for that in your answers. I really just want you to take the explanation given and run it through each of these standards one at a time and tell me how do you think it's doing on story to tell? How is it doing on depth? How is it doing on power? All that kind of stuff. Okay. Neil, you got any questions about power? Sure. Oh yeah, I'm going to talk about that later. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't want to get into it just yet. You'll notice I'm skipping number four for the time being. I'm starting on five. <laughs> um, I'll come back to falsifiability. It's one of the trickiest standards to talk about. Um, but you're, I'll, I'll say this much right now. You're right that <clears throat> with respect to power, we want the hypothesis to explain other things other than the stuff to be explained. But we don't want it to explain everything. That would be a problem. Falsifiability is more complex than that idea, but that's getting in the ballpark. Okay, let's go to let's go to the other the other three that are a little more straightforward. Modesty. Modesty, I, I have it here listed as overkill. That's an easy way to remember this. Modesty is putting the attention on the content of the hypothesis. 
and asking whether the hypothesis is claiming more than it needs to or giving more information than is required, that it's making a stronger claim than is needed in order to get this explanatory work done. Okay, So if depth is like, you're not giving me enough, modesty is like, you're giving me too much, more than is needed. Um, there's kind of a Goldilocks problem here between depth and modesty. Um, too little information, and I need more in order to see how this counts as an explanation, not deep. Too much information, and there's something going on in the hypothesis that I don't have any reason to believe because it's not really doing anything explanatorily useful. It's going overkill on this. Let me give you an example to tell you what I mean. This is also from the homework. Uh, that light in the night sky is moving quickly. Why? Well, because it is the uh, 735 um, United Airlines flight from Boston to Los Angeles or something like that. That is not a very modest explanation because what's really explaining why the light is moving in the night sky? Neil? Like what part of the hypothesis is really doing all the legwork here of offering that explanation? Bingo. Yep. The fact that it's an airplane. That's, if I just said that, if I just said, oh yeah, that's the light in the night sky is moving quickly because it's an airplane. That would have been great. That would have been t perfectly deep. Doesn't need any more explanation. So if the hypothesis being offered goes on to give extra information, then that's not helpful, especially when we're thinking about this in the context of inference to the best explanation. The only grounds on why I'd be justified in believing the hypothesis is actually true is by citing its explanatory usefulness. So anything in the hypothesis that's not being explanatorily useful, I don't have any reason to believe or endorse. It's kind of like that extra information, the overkill part, is a freeloader that's just hitching a ride on the part of the concept or content of the hypothesis that really is doing all the heavy lifting of the explanation. So all the details about it's a United Airlines flight, what time it is, its destination and departure cities, that's all unnecessary. So it can be stripped away. Practically, the way I encourage you to evaluate modesty on the homework problems and on the exam is to ask yourself, is there a simpler version of the hypothesis? Like pare it down, right? Like guard the claim. Is there a weaker version of the claim with less information that's still in the same spirit of the hypothesis that adequately gets this explanatory work done that's still deep. In other words, can we shave off some parts of the hypothesis and still have a good explanation? So that's modesty. And that, that's pretty much it. Um, oh, there's one other little detail here I can talk about. Um, just like some of these standards might matter more than other standards under certain scenarios, it's also true that sometimes these uh, standards step on each other's toes a little bit. Sometimes it's not a you can have your cake and eat it too situation. Um, for this reason, the more, uh, the more information I've got in my hypothesis, like if it's in danger of being overkill, that gives me more resources for how I could use that hypothesis to explain other things too in the same way as I'm explaining this stuff. That kind of elegance, that powerful elegance. Um, so the more power a hypothesis has, eh, the less modest it might be. And the more modest I am with my hypothesis, the less I'm probably going to be able to use that hypothesis to explain other things. So it's going to have less power. So there can be a trade-off there. Sometimes you can come up with explanations that are like perfectly modest and super duper powerful, and that's great. I mean, when that can happen. But under certain scenarios, that may not be able to happen. Um, so uh, especially with uh, cognitive science, that happens quite a lot. That um, Sometimes the, the theories that are offered are pretty complicated, but part of the reason why they're so complicated is that they're not just trying to explain this stuff. They're trying to explain other things too, and they want to get them to have a similar explanation to be connected. Okay, that's modesty. Any any other questions you have about that, Neil?
Cool. And you're feeling good about your, uh, you're feeling confident in your ability to evaluate uh, modesty? Somewhat? Uh, any Anything that you can ask? Yeah. Um, one thing that might be worth uh, me just emphasizing here is that this kind of overkill aspect and the way that you can test it, the hypothesis can be pared down either by removing information like the details from that United Airlines flight example or sometimes um, modifying the strength to make it weaker in the way that we talked about with guarding, like restricting the scope or lowering the level of commitment things like that. Basically, okay. the more that this hypothesis has going on, higher burden of proof, right? Um, it's, it's, it's claiming something more. It's, it's stepping out further on a limb. And we want to get away with just the bare minimum needed in order for it to still be deep. Uh, well, uh, remember again, with these hypotheses in the context of inference, the best explanation, you don't have to provide direct evidence that they're true. The whole, the, the evidence that's being appealed to is its explanatory usefulness. That, I mean, that's why we care about modesty, is that anything that's a part of the hypothesis that's not doing explanatory work for us, we have no reason to believe. Is that helping? Yes. Okay. Oops. What did I do here? There we go. All right. I'm I'm drawing while we've been talking here, and <clears throat> I'm almost ready here for these these next two standards. The last two standards on the list, although we skipped one, um, are very similar to each other. And uh, we've got to be careful about them, making sure that they're separated clearly in principle. So number six is simplicity. Oops, I forgot I had caps lock on. Not to be confused with modesty. Modesty is about how simple the hypothesis is, but simplicity is about something different. Just to make things confusing, again, <clears throat> you can't necessarily use the ordinary usage of the of the words to get a sense of what the standards asking for and number seven is conservativeness okay so here's what's going on with both of these you've noticed in the diagram I've added this area of background assumptions so background assumptions are back <clears throat> I mean they're all over IBE but they're especially relevant here and what's going on is Background assumptions, again, are, are everything I believe about how reality works, um, what I think is true, um, what happens with people, how, the, how physics works, you know, causal laws, um, cultural associations, everything, everything that I am aware of and I build into my picture of how reality is. <clears throat> when we're entertaining uh, an inference the best explanation, we're thinking about whether we should endorse this hypothesis, right? That's the conclusion that's trying to be justified. With these two standards, I'm thinking, what happens if I did that? What if I endorse the hypothesis? I'm like, I'm going to believe this now. I'm basically anticipating what happens when I add this hypothesis into my stock of background assumptions. What happens? With simplicity, there's a concern about whether that is adding something. I'm going to make this bold. Am I adding something new? And with conservativeness, I'm worried about whether there's a conflict 
between the hypothesis and my pre-existing background assumptions. All right, so that's the basic difference here, but let's talk about it in a little more detail. So with simplicity, um, the question here is, uh, oh, well, actually, let me put it this way. These are the bad things. What would be the good thing? Well, the good thing is the same for both simplicity and conservativeness. The ideal explanation, the best explanation, shouldn't require us to change anything about our background assumptions. I just use the things I already have reason to believe are true and mobilize them as the explanation for the stuff to be explained. This is why a lot of scientists don't like string theory. They're like, we can get by without adding in a whole new thing that we think about as a part of reality. String theory is adding a new type of phenomenon to our understanding of reality, strings. And a lot of uh, physicists are like, we can get by with what we got. We're just fine. We can explain all these weird things. I know it looks a little weird right now, but I think we can do it. We don't need to invent anything new and spooky. Just with the stuff that we already have experimental evidence for or some kind of observational evidence for, uh, the things we already have good reason to believe, we can use those to define a hypothesis which can explain the stuff to be explained. We don't need to come up with new stuff or make any changes. Okay, so coming up with new stuff would be like strings. Like, here we're going to endorse something as existing that we didn't endorse before. Um, actually, I got the whiteboard behind me here. Um, I sometimes like to uh, explain it like this. So, Here's a, a, a painting. Uh, can you see that? Uh, is my head in the way? Yeah, okay. Here's a painting. This is like my complete stock of background assumptions. I believe the sun exists, and it shines on uh, water, like there's oceans, and that evaporates water and makes clouds, and, and then it rains, the water cycle, yay. Like this is part of my picture of how reality works. And there are people in it, and families and wait a second wicked witches that's uh, my attempt at drawing a wicked witch I don't know if you can see that Neil is it coming through at all oh that's right the webcam's off dang it okay well I'm describing a uh, maybe you heard it through my words um, I was drawing a picture of a painting and it had a bunch of things in it including the sun and the water and all that stuff. And then I drew a Wicked Witch, or made an attempt at it, and we're like, wait, no, I don't believe in that. So like going back to that problem earlier of trying to explain the stuff to be explained of why we, when we normally have class at this time in this room, I don't see anyone. Oh, because a Wicked Witch made them all invisible. We said that hypothesis is perfectly deep. It's great on depth, but it's really bad on simplicity and conservativeness. That's where we're getting into problems here. Um, I don't know what your background assumptions are like exactly, but in my background assumptions, uh, wicked witches do not exist with the power to turn people invisible. I don't believe in magic in that sense. Um, so for me to endorse this hypothesis requires me to add something to my picture of reality that wasn't there before. And that's what simplicity is concerned about. Whether I need to update my picture in some way. Um, does, uh, any questions, Neil? Okay. Conservativeness, some, a lot of things that aren't simple are also not going to be conservative and vice versa, but it's not always the case. They can be separated. Conservativeness is worrying that in order to endorse this hypothesis, I'm going to have to give up on some of the things I already believe, um, that it's going to be in contradiction or in tension with my pre-existing beliefs and my background assumptions. And I'd prefer not to do that. And that might sound like people being stubborn about changing their mind or not being open-minded or something like that. But that's not the case at all. Um, this is a, a very, I would argue, a very rational way to proceed um, on the grounds that if the only reason I'm being given to endorse the hypothesis is its explanatory usefulness, and I'm comparing that against my background assumptions, which I have otherwise more substantive evidence to believe, which one's going to win out here? 
right? Just a story someone's telling or an explanatory story or the things that I have otherwise good reason to endorse. Um, if I can explain things without having to update that or make some like dramatic or controversial changes to what already makes sense to us, then we definitely prefer that. That would be a better explanation. This is what uh, usually makes conspiracy theories irrational, is sometimes they are very deep and especially powerful. Conspiracy theories specialize in power. If the president was an alien, then so much stuff would make sense, right? Um, or if there's a global conspiracy, then that would explain why there's so much bad stuff going on in the world all the time, right? It's all engineered. These kinds of conspiracy theories uh, are, in one sense, very rational, and that's why people find them compelling. They're usually pretty deep, and they're usually especially powerful. They're not very modest a lot of the time, but, they, but the real thing that makes conspiracy theories dead in the water is conservativeness and oftentimes simplicity too like aliens have been on the earth I, I don't have any reason to believe in aliens so far except for maybe their explanatory usefulness so that's not going to cut it for simplicity with conservativeness a lot of times uh, conspiracy theories require you to give up on beliefs that otherwise you have good evidence to think like I have no no reason to doubt that Donald Trump is a human being like, I, I think he is a live human being. I don't think he's an alien. This isn't like a men in black kind of situation, um, I, alien in disguise. I think Dennis Rodman is a human being. And if they were not human beings, that would be pretty surprising, right? For me to endorse this hypothesis that the, the president is an alien in order to explain other things really requires me to give up on a lot of other beliefs that I have. So for that reason, it's not conservative. So that's not good. Um, we want the hypothesis to just fit right in with everything we already believe. Um, even if it's not doing well on simplicity, at least it might not have a problem with conservativeness. right? It might be adding something new, like strings. Strings add something new to our ontology. They don't really step on the toes of other beliefs, um, depending on who you talk to. Again, so much of whether a hypothesis is simple or conservative depends on what is the content of your background assumptions and that'll differ from person to person and that doesn't mean there isn't some possibility of objectivity here because I mean this is still really useful to understand these standards if you're in a disagreement with someone else about whether an explanation makes sense to you like you maybe it makes sense to you and it doesn't make sense to them maybe you could track it down if you're able to say oh the reason I think it makes sense is it fits with my background assumptions the other person is like doesn't fit with these background assumptions I have and then you're like, oh, okay, so our disagreement about whether this is a good explanation or not comes down to we're going to have to debate which background assumptions are appropriate. And that's helpful, right? That helps us frame where the debate should go next. Um, one, one of, some other things I can talk about with conservativeness. Um, yeah, yeah, let's do this example next. Um, let's talk about Copernicus. Copernicus is one of my favorite examples, and um, I don't know how many of you, Neil, did you ever watch Cosmos, the new Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson? Okay, um, I think this was in Cosmos. Uh, Copernicus is often used as an example, sort of historically, I, I think this is somewhat anachronistic, it's not historically accurate, uh, it's sort of us projecting what we want to see into history here, but sometimes Copernicus is used as like, an example of uh, people who are too close-minded and dogmatic to entertain new ideas even when they're backed by science and this kind of stuff. Copernicus was the guy who posited that the earth is traveling around the sun instead of the sun traveling around the earth. Um, so it, it's not just some kind of uh, egoism on humanity's part that the earth is the center of the universe or some kind of theological metaphysic that sets it up that way it's like well just our basic sense perception like doesn't feel like I'm moving and I watch the Sun move just like someone throwing a ball in the air right um, so our basic senses uh, are the basis for the belief that the Sun is moving we're not and that's not 
a crazy thought. If you don't have um, satellites that can take pictures from orbit and see what's going on, I mean, it's this isn't a this isn't an outlandish notion to believe that the sun is the one that's moving and the Earth is staying put. Okay. Copernicus comes along though and is like, "Y'all are wrong. I have a hypothesis." And it's going to fly in the face of that belief. That belief is going to have to change, right? Instead of the sun traveling around the earth, it's the earth traveling around the sun. Now, what is the stuff to be explained in the case of Copernicus? Well, what led him to this hypothesis is he's trying to explain the motions of the stars in the heavens. So, uh, out, or out in space, I'm, the heavens, is a, that's what Copernicus might say. It's an old old way of speaking, but um, out there, up in, up in space. So uh, other people who are operating under this assumption that the Earth is staying put and everything else is moving around it, um, they're trying to track the motions of stars, and they get these really complicated models for like how they all move, and it's really confusing. Um, there, there isn't a very elegant explanation for making these predictions about why the stars show up where they do, when they do. Copernicus is like, you know what? If I just switch that assumption, if I go from suns traveling around the Earth, everything else is moving around the Earth, to the Earth is traveling around the sun, now I can explain the motions of everything in a really simple, elegant way, really straightforward way. We, we don't have as messy of an ad hoc system here for explaining that star and that star and that star, but everything, everything just s snaps right into place. So its usefulness for power uh, and its depth is really great. But it flew in the in the face of this standard, and it was right. To, I mean, I would, if I may be so bold, um, for people at, at Copernicus's time, maybe some of them, depending on their motives, but for some of them to be like, "Whoa, Copernicus, hold the phone." Uh, on your theory here is not outlandish. It's not a, an example of people being irrational. It's an example of people being rational. I mean, really, all Copernicus has to offer is like, look, this would provide a more elegant explanation of what's going on in reality. But reality isn't always elegant. Um, it doesn't, and we like that as scientists. Um, if we can get all the same explanatory work with less pieces, that's a like Occam's razor principle. Then great, that's awesome. But there are some things that are just complicated. Uh, there's some um, one other thing about string theory for bringing string theory back. Is it's like a real even the people that hate it are like it's beautiful, like it's it's aesthetically pleasing as a theory of physics um, because it takes the standard model, which I don't know how much physics you know, but I'll explain it. Standard model is a bunch of like the fundamental um, subatomic particles that exist. And string theory has an elegant explanation for how they're really all just one thing. It's not like you've got all these fundamentally different things. You just have one thing, strings. And depending on how they're behaving, they behave like these different particles that we observe. But they're not fundamentally different types of particles. So now your theory has just one thing it has to posit instead of a bunch of things. That's more elegant. Um, but that's not necessarily mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. If I, I even think about it this way, if I had to accept the hypothesis, a scientific hypothesis to explain stuff, and in the process I have to dump a bunch of experimental results, what we might call facts, although I, you know I don't, what I think about the fact opinion distinction, but what we would call facts, if I have to get rid of them in order to make sense for my, of my theory, in order to keep my theory, that doesn't seem rational, right? Conservativeness captures that concern, that standard of evaluation here. Um, let me see, is there anything else I'm missing here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one more thing here, and then I'm uh, checking with you again, Neil. Um, so I mentioned that depending on your background assumptions, something might be simple or conservative, like that's different. So historically, uh, Copernicus's hypothesis is not conservative. Um, now, it is very conservative because we have all this other observational evidence to go off of to be like, yeah, the, the Earth is traveling around the sun, all right? Um, and actually, there's some other 
fun things about that that have to do with frames of reference and relative motion from Einstein's theory of relativity, but I'm not going to go down on a tangent right now. Um, but take, let's just let's go back to Wicked Witches. If you just are agnostic about Wicked Witches with the power to turn people invisible through magic, if you're like, I don't know, I don't believe that that's true, that that exists, but, you know, I don't believe that it doesn't exist either. Like, eh, maybe magic happens, I don't know. Maybe ghosts are real, I don't know then a hypothesis that involves those things would be, it wouldn't be simple for you, but it would be conservative, right? It, you don't have to give up any beliefs in order to make room for this new one. You don't have to erase something in the picture and then draw over it, right, to, with, the, with the new hypothesis. But if your background assumptions are like, no, I positively commit to the position that magic does not exist, and there are no such thing as witches that can turn people invisible, then not only is the hypothesis not simple, it's also not conservative for you too, because to endorse it would require you have to ditch that belief. Okay, Neil, is that making sense? That's okay. Bingo. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Right. So, uh, again, some of this does come into the context of comparing explanations against each other, like which one's the best one. Um, and so you're absolutely right that based on how some of these standards might matter more than others, uh, and, you know, you might not be able to have your cake and eat it too on everything, it might be that the best explanation is not conservative or not simple, but it's it's just knocking out of the park on everything else compared with the other hypotheses we have that's like, yeah, this one's ultimately all things considered worth it. Like, yeah, maybe we should change our mind. I mean, to endorse simplicity and conservativeness as a standard for a good explanation does not mean that you're unwilling to ever change your background assumptions, just that you prefer not to, like that, and that it's rational to do that, to have some resistance to doing that, to only do that when you have really good reason for it. Like, absolutely, we would, let's say, um, oh, what's a good example? Okay, let's say this happens to you. You have this, like, crazy spiritual experience where a being of light shows up in your bedroom one night, and it's like, hey, i got to tell you some things. And they give you information that, like, no one else could know, they make predictions, they turn out to be true, they tell you stuff about your past that then you find out was actually true, they say all these things, and you're like, dang, um, I gotta change my worldview, right? Because how do I explain what just happened to me, <laughs> right? As soon as those things happened, um, you're like, okay, I'm in order to explain the stuff that just happened to me, I'm going to endorse a hypothesis that requires me to change some things about my background assumptions. And that's totally fine, right? You wouldn't have any problem doing that. Um, you're like, I don't believe in aliens. And then they show up and they're like, hey, what's up? We're aliens. And then you're like, okay, time to change my background assumptions, right? We're going to be willing to do that under certain cases. Um, but there needs to be really good reason to do that. And as long as I can explain everything I need to, be ex I need to have explained that doesn't require me to do this, and it's just as good as the ones that do require me to change my background assumptions, I'm going to prefer the one that doesn't require me to change my background assumptions. And the reason is not that I'm just attached to them, it's that they are things that have independent reasons why I endorse them in the first place. That's what we're supposed to imagine here. Not just people being like biases or something, like pure bias, but stuff that we otherwise have good reason to believe. All right, we got one more standard here. I've saved it to last. Um, and that is standard 
Number four, falsifiability, which is a mouthful and is real tricky. Definitely tricky. Definitely the hardest. Um, here we go. Oh, crap. I just realized uh, I screwed something up with my picture. I forgot again that my when I use this webcam, it covers up a corner of the diagram. Uh, nuts. Okay, I'll fix that when I post this video. Um, okay. Uh, no, I don't need that. The Okay, that's how I'm going to draw it. And we're going to make this green. All right, you seeing the, the drawing here, Neil? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so... I'll, I, just like with depth, I'll give you a little sentence here that kind of defines falsifiability, and then I'll unpack it, because it's kind of a mouthful. All right, let's go back to depth. When we were talking about depth, we were saying, you know, a good explanation is going to be able to explain why what did happen did happen. It doesn't stand in need of any other explanation in order to see how it counts as an explanation. But a good explanation will explain why what did happen did happen. Falsifiability is saying this. A good explanation also will be able to explain why what didn't happen didn't happen. Or in other words, why something different didn't happen instead of what did happen. So let me give you a, a case example I'll use for this, for falsifiability. Um, let's say uh, we, we have a goldfish at home. Let's say my three-year-old comes to me and he's like, and uh, the goldfish dies. And my son is like, Daddy, why did the goldfish have to die? Gretchen is her name. Why did Gretchen have to die? And I say, oh, it was God's will. I give that explanation. That's my hypothesis. It was God's will for Gretchen to die. That's why she died. This is a bad explanation as it stands. There's a way it could be fixed, but as it stands, just the simple way that I just gave it, it's a bad explanation. And the reason is that it would work just as easily as an explanation no matter what had happened. Let's say Gretchen got sick and died. Well, here's another scenario. Instead, Gretchen gets sick and then gets better. And my son comes to me and is like, Daddy, I thought Gretchen was going to die. Why did she live? And I said, well, it was God's will for her to live. Right? The appeal to God's will as the way of explaining why what happened happened works just as easily to explain the opposite of what happened. Instead of Gretchen dying, Gretchen not dying. Right? If you just take the opposite case, ask yourself, does the hypothesis work as an explanation just as easily there as it did in the original thing to be explained, the stuff to be explained? If it does, that's bad. We don't want that. That's why I drew an X here. We want it to fail. A good hypothesis is falsifiable in the sense that if something different had happened instead, that hypothesis would not work as an explanation. That's a sign that the hypothesis is telling us how to draw the line between what did happen versus what didn't happen. We want that to that we want that to be going on with the explanation. That it's like here's the definitive mark. If I said, um, uh, let's say the situation goldfish dies, and uh, my son comes to me and says, "Why did Gretchen die?" If I said, "Well, because you poured a can of Coke into the fish tank," then that would explain it in a really good way that is falsifiable. If Gretchen gets 
sick and then lives, I couldn't explain her survival on the grounds that a can of Coke was poured into the into the, the fishbowl and, and that's why she lived, right? It wouldn't work there. So that that's the fact that it fails in the opposite case is why it is positively falsifiable. Falsifiability is a good thing. Normally you might think false bad, but falsifiable good. Here's another example that's probably even better than the goldfish one uh, that comes from the homework. So here's a, here's the situation. Um, I fished here all day, but I didn't catch any fish because there are no fish in this river. So stuff to be explained is I didn't catch any fish. Hypothesis, there are no fish in the river. What if the opposite had happened? You know, that's a pretty deep explanation. If, I, if there's no fish in the river, do I expect I'm not going to catch fish? Yep. Is it falsifiable? What if the opposite thing had happened? I caught some fish, and I try to use the hypothesis to explain that. Oh, I caught a bunch of fish today, and you know why? It's because there were no fish in the river. That just is absurd. It makes no sense as an explanation. So that's a good thing. That's, that's a really good sign that what we've landed on with the hypothesis is sort of the dividing line. Like, this is the deal maker, deal breaker. Catching fish comes down to whether there's fish in the river or not. Like, that's the thing. Even if I said, um, I didn't catch any fish because I suck at fishing. Like, I'm bad at fishing. If that was the hypothesis instead, that would also be falsifiable. I caught a bunch of fish. Why? Well, because I'm so bad at fishing. What? That doesn't make sense. Is this working for you, Neil? Okay. Maybe I'm getting better at explaining this, and I maybe I shouldn't have made it so scary sounding. <laughs> um, but I mean, there is some there are some cases where this gets a little sticky. Um, the in principle, like maybe some other cases are not quite as clean as the one I just offered, um, and my like suggested technique here. Imagine the opposite and ask yourself if the hypothesis would be able to work as an explanation for that. And if it can't work, that's a good thing. If it does work, that's a bad thing. Um, there's some situations where this gets a little tricky. Um, but the spirit of falsifiability is the idea that if this explanation is informative and insightful and useful, if the world was different, it wouldn't work. Right? It's like it's identifying this kind of key variable for why, like I said earlier, what did happen, not only what did happen did happen, but also why something different didn't happen instead. That's also something that a, a really robust explanation does for us. Um, so where, what's a really sticky case here? Well, one of the other problems from the homework is I didn't catch any fish, even though I fished here all day, because I'm unlucky. Now that might seem like it's falsifiable in a mechanical way that I just gave that technique, but it actually is not falsifiable. And let me explain that a little bit. So again, uh, didn't catch fish because I was unlucky. Unlucky is a hypothesis. What if I did catch fish? Can I explain that on the grounds that I was unlucky? No, that seems weird. That's kind of absurd. No, of course not. But actually, this is a unfalsifiable explanation because basically, you have to just treat it not as uh, unluckiness, but appealing to the phenomenon of luck, so to speak. Um, the And the concern here is that whether I'm lucky or not just depends on the outcome. So if I had caught fish, I would have been like, oh, I was lucky. right? It's not this dividing line of, well, if you're lucky or not lucky, then that'll determine whether you catch fish or not. right? If I'm appealing to luck as the way to explain what happens, Nothing, nothing that happens in the world would ever stop me from being able to use that explanatory device. Just like the case of no matter what happens to the goldfish, I can explain it as God's will, no matter what. Now, if let's say luck was a more independent phenomenon that wasn't just based on the result, but was something we could like measure, like if I had a luck detector, and I could be like, dee -dee 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 -dee. oh, you're really lucky today. Uh, yeah, this reading is looking really good. You should definitely buy a lotto ticket. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, no, don't go fishing today. You're not going to catch any fish because your luck meter, right, like midi-chlorians or something from Star Wars. Um, if there was some independent 
uh, phenomenon here, then it could work as a good explanation. But the fact that an appeal to luck just is really based on the outcome rather than the dividing line between what did happen versus what didn't happen, it's really explanatorily useless. Um, I can go back to the God case too. So I mentioned that this could be fixed and it, and it would be falsifiable. Um, and this actually, I don't know how many of you care about theology or, or Christian or uh, Jewish or, or Islamic, um, but uh, even if you're not, this might still be fun. Um, the problem of evil is a major philosophical problem for belief in God, and this scenario kind of gets into that, uh, some of the philosophical underpinnings for this. Um, but, so I was saying that just the bare thesis that it was God's will is not falsifiable. They can be used for everything, and people do sometimes do this. They're like, oh, it was God's will, and it's kind of the same superstitious thinking that's involved with luck. Um, but it could be something more substantive. If In the original hypothesis, it's just God can do anything. So he can, that he can be the explanation for everything because he's omnipotent, right? But the other thing that you could, you could start uh, putting into the hypothesis is some sort of commitment about God's character. Like, what does God do with his power? And if you had a theory about that, then to say it was God's will, that's why this happened, could actually be falsifiable. That, like, God wouldn't will something different to have happened instead because that would be inconsistent with God's character. Right? And that's why I was saying this is going in the case of the problem of evil because the, the whole dilemma of the problem of evil is that how could there be so much evil in this world and still there's a God who exists, is good, and is all-powerful? It's like, why would a good God that has the power to stop things not stop all this terrible stuff from happening? How do you explain the tragedy of the world with a God that is good and loving and, and has the power over everything, right? And that's, uh, that's a deep problem. It, it is not a slam dunk objection by any stretch of the imagination, but it's also tough to give a, uh, a satisfactory, sufficient uh, reply to that objection. If you ever want to have that debate with me, it's a fun one. I love exploring it. Uh, it there's a lot of cool things there. Um, but that's kind of, once you start committing to something about God's character and what God cares about, his values, whatever, uh, then maybe if something different had happened instead, then that the hypothesis would fail as an explanation in that. Like, you can't explain this tragedy because of a good God or something like that. Um, if reality was like this, like, a good God wouldn't do that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, sometimes uh, an explanation that is not originally falsifiable can be made falsifiable by adding more content to it, um, in which case there could be a stepping on the toes of modesty there too. Again, not all these standards always fit with each other. Um, okay, I think that might be good for us here. And we're at 2 hours and 15 minutes, so I'm thinking about wrapping up this video. Um, oh, code word. What should we do? How about luck detector? That's going to be our code word for today. Luck detector, which is fun to say. Um, so that's that. Um, Neil, do you have any questions? How's this gone? So, Um, that's getting more in the direction of putting some content to it. Now, there there are some tricky things here because, um, well, no, 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 no. Okay, this is good work. So, if you're trying to respond to the problem of evil by saying, ultimately, and this is like a classic response that for all the evil in the world, this is the best of all possible worlds. That any other arrangement, if it didn't have these terrible things in it, would actually ultimately be worse. Um, in fact, uh, there's something kind of like um, the uh, the Matrix movies. Do you remember, did you ever see the Matrix, Neil? Okay, so do you remember when in the first movie Agent Smith says, 
previous versions of the Matrix were like utopian, and they just people's minds revolted. Like it just didn't work. They had to inject some pain and suffering and stuff into into the simulation of reality in order for it to be like compatible with human minds. But but not just that because uh, that might sound terrible. Like the Buddhist in me is just like Ugh, about that kind of statement. But um, it might be that there's something actually deeply meaningful about it. Um, that would justify it that a world in which no one would like say have freedom or could do certain things um to, to do evil would be morally worse it would be unideal as an existence if we didn't have free will free will doesn't explain all of the problem of evil but um maybe things like without tragedy in the world um we wouldn't have these opportunities for building relationships in a deeper way kind of like how affluence can be a really empty life. Everyone's fine, no one needs each other, but then their relationships are kind of more superficial. They're not as deep as when you have to like struggle through things together or there's complications or stuff like that. Again, this is a much longer debate and I, I don't want to get on a huge philosophical tangent here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's how that could be falsifiable. That you could say, actually, if there was less tragedy in the world, that would be worse. A good God wouldn't create a world in which there was less tragedy. You still there, Neil? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, try out the basic method that I first described. That, that, that should be square one. Imagine the opposite of the stuff to be explained. And just ask yourself, does this hypothesis work as an explanation there? And if it does, that's a problem. Uh, if it doesn't, that's a positive sign. But maybe double check on it and be like, is there whatever is the kind of phenomenon that the hypothesis is appealing to, is that the kind of thing that... Um, could break down as a way to explain the line that's drawn between this happening versus this happening. Oh, 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 okay. Absolutely, yeah. Maybe not a full paragraph, but like a couple sentences for each for sure. Um, you'll go through, I'll give you the, the an, an, uh, a thing to be explained and the stuff that's being, uh, the hypothesis being offered to explain it. You'll have to identify which is which, and it's very important to not get them backwards here. Um, but uh, figure, you'll, you'll be given that, and you'll, you'll have to go through it and be like, yep, it has a story to tell, or no, it's doing bad on this, and here's why I think that. Here's how it's doing on depth. Good, bad, here's why. Power, good, bad, here's why. Falsifiability, modesty, simplicity, conservativeness. You'll have to address every single standard. Um, on the homework, it doesn't require that, and I'd still recommend maybe trying out doing that, um, but there's so many homework problems, like it takes a lot of work to do that. The fact that there's only one problem on the exam for IBE is why I need you to address every standard, because you've got to prove to me that you know all of them not just the ones that are jumping out to you as bad. Um, so, uh, yeah, you'll have to address every single one. Okay. All right, we're good? Cool. Those of you uh, watching on YouTube later, let me know if you got any questions. Um, post things into that discussion board, um, and I'll be doing a supplement video at some point here to, to wrap this up. Um, homework day, I think, is Thursday, so I will try to get a video out maybe on Friday um, reviewing uh, any questions you have about the 8, 9, 10 homework, and then over the weekend you've got the exam to take, so we'll be doing that. Um, good luck with it. There's a lot here, and I'm always 
uh, happy to talk to you and and um, explain things further. I have no problems repeating myself. That's my job to repeat myself <laughs> as a teacher. Uh, but good luck with all this, and I'll see you next time.